Um, our project was covering algorithmic composition, and it was focusing on stochiastic chains, um, mostly focusing on Markov process. So I'm Monica. Eric. Theo. Chris. All right, so first we just need to go into an overview of what stochastic music is. And essentially it's chance music. It's music where there are elements in it that are put out of the reach of the composer either in one of two ways. The first way is that the composer doesn't do the chance process while they're composing the music, but rather they include it in the parts. And they give control of how long a passage is going to be played on the oboe for 15 seconds or something like that, and then the oboist is going to do that how many ever times they feel like. And the procedures, generally what that will do is cause the music to sound different every single time it's performed, even though there's still a kind of a set length. Like, I have an example on our next slide of just a quick piece of Lewislawski Symphony Number no. 3. You can see down at the bottom in this oboe line right there, you see how it has that wiggly line. That's actually telling the performer to repeat that ad lib, and that's a form of stochasticism. However, there's another type, and that's using chance procedures or algorithms to literally actually compose your music. And as such, you see a few early examples throughout history, like Mozart's dice game, where he composed out 11 specific modules, and then using dice, two dice, he'd be able to roll and figure out which one goes here and align them in a certain way. And thus you end up with something that will sound He's already got the modules composed, but depending on how you roll the dice is how it's going to be set up. All right, and then additionally we've developed, as we've gone on, we've developed new methods to compose music by chance, and though algorithms have been used in music for a long time, we've found out that using an algorithm in a computer is a fairly simple way to generate a piece with set parameters, but still it is completely unique. And one of the people who pioneered this is, well, Xenakis, as we talked about before. But we need to explain algorithms a bit more to make full sense of this. Um, so algor algorithms uh, were developed by the Arabic mathematician in the ninth century. Um, they're defined as a predetermined set of instructions for solving a specific problem in a limited number of steps. Um, so the algorithmic revolution, which is started in like the 1950s, um, actually was focused more on not only like how the art was produced, but also like the function and the self, like the self concept. Um, so forms that were used in like the algorithmic revolution were like automatism, random operations, rule-based systems, and auto poetic strategies. Um, so more history on algorithms. So they're traced to the beginning of the European polyphony in the Middle Ages. Um, organum or Gregorian chants was like, I guess, the earliest example. Um, some other early examples of algorithmic pieces are box encoded pieces. So to extrapolate on this, organum is a system of early polyphony where there was a composed outline, a cantus firmus. And then through an improvised practice that was dictated out in several treatises such as Guido's Microcosmos, if you want to go look that up, very fun. But he lists out steps that you'd follow. So let's say I do a G, C, D, that's my melody. What the organum would tell me, I have the option of going down a fourth or a fifth, and then when I move to the next note, I can either move in parallel junction with it, so 
if I'm going a fourth down, it would be G, C, and then the next note is going to be the D, so I'd move up a step with it. So it would be A, D, so G, C, A, D, right there, and you'd move like that. Or it gives you another option where a chance process comes in that you could stay stagnant on the same pitch so long as it's not a dissonant interval. So in that way, we start to see some of the use of algorithms and how it can produce different music every single time. And on top of this, the practice of organum for the first several hundred years that it was used, it was an improvised practice, so it wasn't written down. Therefore, there was no way to say that this has to be the way that this line is performed. You have a choice. And then with the box encoder piece, which you basically he wrote out approximately 53 minutes of music, but it was all encoded in a way where you'd have to go through the musical transformations and kind of decode it to figure it out, which the compositional devices, such as the retrograde and the inversion, are technically step-by-step -step processes that fit into the method of algorithm. And then I noted also at the bottom that the voice-leading principles that we associate with tonal harmony like the 5 to 1 cadence. Those are all technically algorithms too because it's a list of steps that you have to follow in order to get from one process to another. Um, a couple of other um, individuals or pioneers in like algorithms and music uh, would be Joseph Schillinger. He published his um, system of musical composition which um, focused like on theories of like rhythm and harmonies, um, melodies, and semantics. Um, he developed a method of musical composition mostly through using algorithms and the mathematical process. Um, Hiller was another one. Uh, he conducted his first experiments in computer-generated music and he used like a three-step approach. Um, for He used a generator, a modifier, and a selector and this can be um, exemplified in the iliac suite. So basically the only difference between putting it on the computer and listening to the rules of tonal harmony is that the computer is the one that abides by the algorithm and makes the decisions, not by the composer. chains in our project. Um, Andrew Markov discovered Markov chains in 1906. Um, Markov chains are basically tables or chains that, as Eric was saying, randomly chooses different values from, but but it's not randomly choosing them. They, they are based on the past and the previous values in the Markov table. Um, or Markov chains because I looked at Markov table and it was actually like different like variations of a table, it was, uh, the, it was like a circle graph and then it had an actual table. I have an example of a table on the next one. But um, we did implement it in our project as you will see once we get to the patches. Um, this is an example, it's just a basic example of a, of a Markov table with um, a couple notes. As you can see, you, get, you have your first value and depending on the percentages of the next value and the previous value, you'll get your present value. Um, a Markov table can't have a problem or a seemingly problem when it has 0% or it's impossible or it can't go anymore. You can make it do that or you can you know, choose which one you want to do, but as far as choosing random numbers, that's what the Markov table was created for. Alright, so now getting towards our instrument. What we did is we used the Markov tables and we primarily used them to generate the pitch. So when it goes in, basically what's going to happen is that we can either put in, uh, we can create a Markov table in a series of probabilities and chances 
through two ways. The first one would be to play either through a MIDI keyboard or the on-screen pace slider, play a series of notes, and it will generate a table from that directly. The second way, which we'll implement, is that we can actually load any MIDI file, a zero format zero file, into our analysis, and based on that file, we'll generate the probabilities of everything happening. So, by doing that, what we can do is model music such as we chose a uh, Bach Pasicalia. So, Start that because this opening motive is very important in the generation process. So using that, that's a main because it's a Pasicalia that permeates throughout the entire piece. That's going to be very prominent in the Markov chain and perhaps depending on how it plays you might actually be able to hear it quoted almost directly. So then the other parameters, I said that pitch is generated through the Markov tables and the probabilities associated with it. We then randomized the velocity velocity of the notes through a random function and then scaling it so it would come out in one that way Max would be able to read it without distorting. And then as for the rhythm, we created a general tempo through the trans transport function. And then using the controller, we have a preset list of rhythms from the rhythm syntax in Max that allows us to choose what value the note will be when it's in its distinct voice. So we can choose based on the list through the use of the controller, I think, between anything from the 16th note to a triplet 16th note, and then there's also dotted values in there. So using that, we can manually adjust as we feel necessary each individual voice. So if we wanted them all firing at the same tempo of quarter notes, we can do that. Or we could also change it so it's in a proportion of a whole note to a quarter note to eighth notes in one line. And using that, it prevents the composition from being too, of having too much entropy. You'll actually be able to relate to something if we so choose, because we can keep it regular. Whereas we have very little control. We have no control over the random velocity and the pitch is generated based on probability and we can't really impact that except if we played something on the keyboard. How much time do we have? You're at the 14 minute mark now, but I started this a little bit before you guys started, so you, uh, let's just say five minutes. Is that enough? Yeah. yeah. So you guys are probably wondering how did we do this in terms of programming, right? So uh, let's get everything running. So we were having problems uh, with the like, loading the file, so we're gonna make Eric play some notes mm -hmm. to get something going. If you can go ahead.
behind me, whatever the city looks like. Well, we can kind of go through the process while we're yeah. doing this. So, basically, the patch is constructed with a series of sub patches. The first one that we started with originally was the actual ability to load the MIDI file. And, like I said before, Max only loads format zero MIDI files, which has turned out to be a constant problem throughout the entire thing because most MIDI files that you'll find online are usually in format one because if they contain more than one instrument or more than one note even sometimes they'll split it out into multiple tracks. And then as I said about the tempo we had we used the transform function or the transport to create a general tempo map that we could then use and manipulate. Additionally, one of the things is if we wanted to model a fugue, let's say, where there are specific entrances that come in at specific times, we can actually use time points where throughout the composition we can have certain, we can have the first voice pop in at the beginning and then have the second voice show up at bar 8 according to the transport with the time point function. And that, like I said, if we're trying to copy a fugue, we can actually graph out the entrances from the Bach piece and put them in as necessary. All right, so I, I found out the problem. So let's start again. Loading the file. The file, and then we start and then uh, we turn on our, you know, tempers. We should have some. Actually, right now, if you listen very closely in the physical modeling component, it's been working kind of on the Bach mode of the dun dun dun. That G to E flat has been pretty prominent in it, and right there, the dun dun was also part of the Bach. So you can actually, even though we don't have it, so it's scaled to a certain part of the range. It actually, by pitch, it's playing a similar motive to what Bach wrote. Turn up the mixer a little bit, so we can turn up the on the mixer. Turn it up. So we have the ability as a human to work our way up to that where we could have maybe one of them be at the whole note providing a nice pedal foundation while we have one top voice going absolutely crazy and one in the middle, kind of in the middle, in between the two tempos. Okay. similar because of like the subject field so we're yes. just going to try to give you a brief overview of the history and we'll spend more time on the batch because that's what's, that's what's different so algorithmic composition, generative processes, and Markov tables. So to go over some brief history stuff, the whole subject of composing algorithmically existed like way before the computer as they said with people like the Greeks and 
Gregorian chants and stuff like that, and popular composers were like Johann Bach and Joseph Haydn and Amadeus Mozart. Like they said, with his musical dice game, he created a he created a certain number of competition compositions or fragments of a composition. He rolled two dice, he added the sum, and that's how he created the order for it. And then later, more complicated versions were done by John Cage. And and then later, when the computer was introduced into the whole mix, Hiller and Isaacson created, used the Iliac High Speed Computer to create the Iliac Suite, which was the first composition using raw materials and data. And it modified it using various functions programmed by Hiller and Isaacson. And it chose it based on a specific rule set that was also programmed by them. And while they were made by the computer, this wasn't the first instance of it being played by the computer like we're doing now. It was transposed into sheet music and played by small orchestras or quartets and stuff like that. And then later, they used this to create the program Music Comp, which was one of the first actual programs made for automated compositions. And then you have Yanis Zanakis, like Dr. Wallace. She showed us last week who would create a program that would produce data for his stochastic compositions, which is basically, as the other group said, it includes randomness and choosing variables, but within a specific group of variables. So it's not absolutely random, it's random within a specific group. And I just like pulled this quote to, to really explain this program. It would, it would make a score from a list of node densities and probabilistic weights supplied by him leaving specific decisions to a random number generator. So pretty much more technical version of how the stochastic programming worked. And also it was still performed by live musicians instead of performed like by the computer like it is in present day. Um, the part I'm going to talk about is the uh, Markov chains, which was in, obviously invented by Markov. Uh, Markov chains were actually originally used for language research and comprehension. So they were used for like words and stuff, and uh, the way it was applied to music is like it takes, like like just for example, use their project. You just send in MIDI. So what it does is it, it analyzes like the structure of the song, as in pinch, pitch, tempo, and it breaks down into several variables. And using those variables, you can re recreate entirely new songs based on those parameters. Um, it's kind of like a weighted prob probability, like like in what you did in math in high school. Um, the actual definition I have is it calculates various states, sequence, transitions, and uh, it base, creates an algorithm chosen based on the variables and variables that are input. Yeah, just cover all that. So, references. so I guess uh, we'll actually get into the patch, which I'll talk about after I open this up. We pretty much did. Um, we use Markov chains to basically control the frequency and the amplitude. And everything else is kind of, I guess you could say, chaotic or random. So I'll just talk about it first before we actually play it. So over here, we actually have all of the Markov uh, generation. And what it does is for the first 30 notes of the piece, let me screen capture this. <laughs> okay. Because that's the part that I lose, right? As you guys explaining the patch while you're. So basically what it does is when you first open the patch, the first 30 pitches of the piece are completely random. And then these are passed into an anal object, which is making a Markov chain behind the scenes. And after that, those first 30 pitches are done, it turns off the random number generator and starts switching over to the actual prob object, which is generating all of the Markovian um, frequencies, pitches, uh, and amplitude. That data is then sent over here, where I'm actually uh, scaling it for amp, uh, amp control and also using uh, ZLOOKUP table to basically define the scale degree that it's reading from. And that's it in terms of the actual frequency and amplitude. So then um, here I have a way to kind of control the note length, which is again chaotic and random. The whole piece is kind of organized randomness, I guess. So um, what it's doing is you actually can control the length, the um, maximum length of a note from the phone that I have controlling this, which is what this is all for. It 
takes the random, adds a 500 uh, millisecond minimum for the length note, uh, or no length, and passes it over to the main metro object, which is controlling the actual advancement of the prob object. And then all of that data is sent down to here, which is um, all of the synthesis. So for the melody of the piece, I primarily, we primarily uh, use mostly uh, frequency modulation and amplitude modulation. And what it's doing is based on this up here, which is uh, kind of like a beat control, it basically is randomly determining when to play a synthesized drum. And that beat also controls when everything else changes. So every time this drum beats, the, care, uh, the os uh, modulating signal for the amplitude and frequency both change. And the number of sidebands in the uh, modulation changes. The um, tonality of the drum actually changes based on each hit. And all of that's um, control, uh, passed together and um, modified by the amplitude. And then um, I actually have a filter down here, which you can also change from the phone. And for the actual control, I used an app called Control uh, OSC. And using the UDP receive object, um, I just send data from my phone to the actual IP address of the computer to port 8080 and just route all those objects and have all the control data. So if you want to go ahead and turn it on, it's a little bit chaotic sounding because I mean it is completely random. So, so right now what it's doing, let's see, is it receiving my data? It's not, because I got kicked off a lot. Ah, oh, there we go. So basically, on here, I have a way to control the tonic, which is very, very ugly sounding frequency mod or amplitude modulation. But um, I can control the tonic of the actual melody uh, with one of the sliders on here. So I can move it up, and we have a very high pitched sound. You can also turn it down, and we can have very low, it's supposed to be low, there we go, lower sounds. Um, let me turn this off so you can actually focus on. So I can actually control the probability of the beat, so I can actually just turn it off so we won't hear that anymore. Um, for the note length, I have a slider that if pushed all the way up, it makes the maximum note length four seconds. And at its lowest, it can make it 600, uh, 600 milliseconds. Um, with uh, the buttons that I have on here, you can actually change the tonality from major, uh, we have a minor scale, which kind of hard to hear it with the frequency modulation, but it is actually changing the tonality of the piece. Um, well, it's a switch from that. <laughs> but uh, then we also have a mixolydian scale and a pentatonic scale. And then anytime you want to generate new possibilities for the actual frequency and uh, amplitude, um, there's a button on here to actually restart this whole process and generate 30 new pitches for it to generate. So after hitting that button, it starts the counter again and starts inputting more random values to kind of change the weights around and kind of generate itself. Um, and then with the actual um, filter that we have, you can control the low pass filter to only allow certain frequencies through to kind of change the overall tonality of the piece. And then for the like I said, I can, um, using this slider right here, I can actually put it so that half the time it'll um, strike a beat. Let's see if it actually trigger. There we go. And the actual uh, subdivisions for how often it hits is also random. So what it does is it takes the note length and divides it by a random number, and that determines how fast it'll actually strike. So if I turn up the time so you can actually hear the subdivisions, now it's beating a little bit slower, and if it happens again, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's a little bit faster that time. Sometimes it'll, it kind of have, has a mind of its own. Sometimes it'll actually freak out and do a little kind of noise, but then other times you get more melodic lines when the beat subsides. And uh, that's pretty much our whole piece. Is there a presentation mode to this, or is this...? Uh, no. No, okay. I wasn't originally planning to I was in, that. Yeah, I was just curious how you would 
make a presentation. Yeah, that that's yeah. kind of why I had trouble with it because there's not really much to control in the patch mm -hmm. unless you want it to change. I guess there isn't anything. Really. It's all controlled uh, with the control. That, that, okay. You can always give it the option to have controls in the patch as well. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Let's give a round of applause for a second.